not a fish person, even though I work on the clownfish symbiosis. Um, so mostly coral reefs and broadly um, symbiotic interactions. So I, I did my um, undergrad at Otterbein University, went and did a master's degree, and, uh, and then ultimately finished my PhD at Ohio State. But in between that, uh, in between my master's and my PhD, I did a year-long stint at Reef Systems Coral Farm, which is right outside of Columbus, Ohio. And so uh, that was really my full immersion into the hobby and into the aquarium trade. And so we had big raceways where we were fragging, tank, uh, fragging coral. Uh, we had lots of clients that I would go drive around the city and um, do water changes and animal husbandry type stuff. And we also had some collaborative research with um, biologists at Ohio State. But this is really where I became more fam familiar with the animals that are in the trade and kind of got interested in the number of species that are in the trade um, and sort of combined my academic background with my interest for marine ornamental invertebrates. And so that kind of leads me to uh, the main question and the topic of today's talk and which is really, are there cryptic or undescribed species uh, in the aquarium trade? So as you can probably imagine, because I'm up here talking about this, the answer is yes. Um, but one of the things I wanna kind of impress upon you today is that these are not uh, little hitchhiker species or little you know, encrusting sponges that are just hitchhiking on your live rock um, when, you bring a, when you set up a tank, but these are real species that you have purchased uh, on purpose. Uh, that you think you know really well. Um, but I'm gonna be talking today about we might not know them quite as well as, as we may think. So before we kind of dive into uh, the actual uh, work that I've done, I wanna just kind of clarify a few terms that I'm gonna be throwing around. Uh, the first one is what is a cryptic species? Um, so you're probably all very familiar with uh, the giraffe. Uh, it is described as a single species throughout Africa. Um, and really what a cryptic species um, really means is uh, what you see is not what you get in terms of the actual number of species. So if we were to go take genetic samples from all the giraffes in Africa, do some DNA sequencing, if it turned out that there were multiple species of giraffes that were indistinguishable just using the outward physical appearance, um, genetically it tells a different story. So that's what I'm referring to when I'm talking about cryptic species. And in fact, um, I didn't just randomly pick that example. That's actually true. Um, and so uh, throughout Africa, this bar plot up top is just showing clusterings of genetic individuals um, across Africa. And so this work was done a couple years ago where they actually did the DNA sequencing of giraffes. And it turns out that they are four genetically distinct things. Um, and the other thing I really want to make a point about is that these are not like fake pseudo species or uh, these are in some way not real things. Uh, these four different species of giraffes and these cryptic species that I'm gonna be talking about today are very, very distinct. So these four species split one to two million years ago. So these things are highly diverged. Um, and to put that into perspective, uh, anatom anatomically modern humans are about 200,000 years old. So these animals that are cryptic, this cryptic species, um, these are real old animals. Uh, they're in your tank um, and they're real species. So that's uh, one of the important things about um, my talk today. So ultimately though, um, why is this important? Um, I really like the aquarium trade because I love these animals. I think they're fascinating. I think you probably also think that they're also kind of fascinating. So it's inherently important to know what's what uh, natural historians have been trying to figure out why the world looks the way it does and how many species there are for hundreds of years. Um, so this kind of inherently interesting component is why I got into it. Um, but maybe a more practical side is from maybe a conservation standpoint. Uh, if you're trying to conserve a species or conserve populations or set sustainable harvest quotas, it's really important to know what you actually have. So for instance, if you happen to work on a coral species that's described as having a range the entire size of the Caribbean, um, but you do the DNA sequencing and you find out that Florida has something that's really unique and different from everything else, if you take all of that out of Florida, there's no other population that's gonna come to the rescue of that species in Florida, and so you would essentially be driving something to extinction. So from a conservation standpoint, 
it's really important to know what species are what. That's kind of like the basic thing. And then of course, staying on theme uh, with MACNA, if you have cryptic species and you're trying to aquaculture them or you're trying to breed them in your tank, it's hard to breed two different species. So, you know, you might be chasing the water chemistry or the lighting or any number of things about your tank down the rabbit hole when in, in fact it could just be you might have two different things. So, um, this is really why it's important. So, kind of wanted to set that up before we dive in. Um, and now I want to just show you some of the species that I've worked on. Um, I think you all probably recognize this one. This is the bubble tip sea anemone. Again, we're not talking about fish. Um, so I've worked a lot on Entech Maya quadricolor over the last couple of years. <laughs> uh, the magnificent anemone, which I believe is called the Ritteri anemone in the trade. It's a common one, fun to photograph on reefs. The leathery sea anemone, Heteractus crispa, which I believe is also called the sea bay anemone. This was a really common one until a couple years ago when Florida Fish and Wildlife shut uh, the collecting down of the Condi anemone in the Florida Keys. So this is the giant Caribbean anemone Condylactus gigantea. You might not be as familiar with this one. I think this was popular in the trade in the 90s um, or maybe even early 90s, earlier than that when it was kind of getting up and running. This is the corkscrew sea anemone Bartholomea annulata. This is a Caribbean species. It's basically a giant aptazid with slightly more interesting tentacles. Um, <laughs> Of course, everybody's favorite, the sexy shrimp, Thor ambinensis, is a species we've worked on quite a bit. And then some really stunning animals that are not quite as common in the trade, but they live in the Caribbean. This is the spotted cleaner shrimp, Periclemenes yucatanicus. This is harvested a little bit commercially in the Florida Keys. Uh, it's a, it's, it cleans parasites off of fish. And then the same, it's a sister species. This is uh, Peterson's cleaner shrimp in Silomenes peterson. I also um, a really important cleaner shrimp species in the Caribbean. And so this, this will remove parasites from over 20 families of common reef fish. So it's really important for the health of the reefs. Also a beautiful animal. So these are just some of the animals that I've done genetic work on. And it turns out that these are eight described species and we found at least 25 different cryptic species within just these eight nominally described lineages. And so if that's even a moderately decent snapshot of the cryptic diversity in the aquarium trade, uh, when you go out on the floor and you see all the anemones and all the corals and all the cleaner shrimps running around, you know, we're talking about maybe three times, the, the trade is almost three times more diverse um, than what is currently recognized in the scientific literature. So there's a, an, a really a stunning amount of hidden species diversity out there. So, um, I'm going to take the next little bit um, to tell a couple different stories. And the first one's going to be about the sexy shrimp. So this is one of my favorite animals. Um, does anyone here own or have owned the sexy shrimp in the past? Yeah. Anybody breed it? Andy, of course. <laughs> so yeah, so this is a really fun species. Um, obviously really popular. I wish I had a video for you, of course, to see the little butt waggle. Um, but obviously very popular. Um, it's globally distributed, so it's considered one species uh, that lives in all tropical oceans. So it's found in the Red Sea and in the Indian and Pacific Oceans, all the way in the Caribbean, tropical eastern Atlantic, tropical eastern Pacific. Um, and this thing is really, really small. So uh, again, this is um, a really teeny thing with a range. You cannot get a bigger range than what the sexy shrimp currently has. So again, it's commonly bred um, by hobbyists. And one of the things that I found really interesting about Thor um, is this sort of dichotomy between the hobby and the science and so, and how there's maybe not as many open avenues of communication between the two as there probably should be. And so academically, uh, what we knew about Thor um, in terms of like its larval duration, so one of the things we always want to know, how many days um, is a species in this little pelagic larval stage before it's going to metamorphose. That's obviously critically important if you're going to breed this. Uh, there was one paper done back in the late 70s by a guy named Sarver, and I think he had them in a tank. They were larval stages for over 50 days. They wouldn't metamorphose and settle. 
And so basically for 30 years, that's essentially what we thought. We thought this one centimeter long shrimp had an insanely long larval dispersal phase, which would make sense if you have a range that's the entire size of the globe. Um, fast forward to about a year ago, there was another group that came and, and actually tested that um, and pinned, the, pinned it down that you know, it was only 28 day larval phase. So it turns out that whatever was going on in the 70s just couldn't get it to settle. Um, this thing only has a 28 day larval phase, but when you go on to the aquarium forums and go back probably a decade or more, um, everybody in the trade knew that it was a 28 day larval phase. So um, you can find online forum threads dated from you know, the mid 2000s that you know, everyone had this locked down in the trade that this is how many days the species of shrimp hung around before it settled, but we just didn't have anything peer reviewed in the literature. So there's, you know, this is just kind of one of those interesting examples of how things can get lost in translation between hobby and science a little bit. So I started working on uh, Thor uh, in 2013 when I was starting a collecting trip or planning a collecting trip to the Florida Keys. It was the first major research ex expedition that I led uh, for my PhD. And so of course when you go anywhere to collect animals off the reef, you need to have the right permits. So uh, you get with Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and you say this is what I want to take and I need some permits. So you get a big collecting permit from Florida Fish and Wildlife and then because you're in the National Marine Sanctuary you need a big permit from NOAA so you get a NOAA permit excuse me and then if you want to collect in a state park you get a third permit from the Department of Environmental Protection. So there's a lot of layers um, to go through, and one of the things I learned about Thor is that it's actually in Florida, it is unlisted, at least it was, as a marine ornamental species. And uh, that's kind of interesting. I don't think many of these things are coming from Florida. I could be wrong, maybe that's changed. Uh, I think most are probably coming from Bali or the Indo Pacific. Um, however, if you have a permit and something is unlisted, that means that in Florida, you can collect 75 pounds per person per day of that species. And so this struck me as quite comical because this is a centimeter long shrimp and this is, there might not even be 75 pounds of it on the entire reef track. So uh, again, you know, the, the talk after me was going to be Colin Ford. He was going to talk about the rock flower anemone which became really popular in Florida after they shut the condylactis fishery down. So any shift in demand in the trade uh, can lead to massive swings in population decline if you know, the right uh, conservation or harvest quotas are not put in place and this is just kind of an example of what seems to be a bit of a gap in oversight here. Um, that, that could have changed in the last couple of years, but I don't, I don't know, not, not to my knowledge. Um, so because this thing has a massive range, uh, you need to collect samples from all over the world to understand how many species uh, belong, belong, in, or belong to it or make up this nominal lineage and so we collected in about a dozen locations just in the Caribbean and then we used natural history collections to expand uh, globally throughout the most part of the range. We're missing some spots in the Indian Ocean that would have been nice to have. But we ended up with over 380 individual samples uh, for this study and we sequenced each of those with three genes um, to really pin down how many species is Thor, or really just test whether it is really a, a single species. So when we got the data back, and this paper was published uh, last year, uh, what we found is just look at the colors here, this will kind of walk you through this. Uh, we found that Thor is at least five different species, which is probably unsurprising uh, given its range is separated by hard barriers to dispersal and land masses like the Isthmus of Panama and so forth. And so those were the Red Sea, the tropical western Atlantic, so basically the Caribbean, um, a lineage in Japan, a lineage in the south central Pacific, uh, mostly in the Marquesas, it was uh, unique. And then of course we found a really widespread species in the Indo-West Pacific. <laughs> and one of the things that I wanted to mention, it's really hard to see on this figure so I apologize, that these are really old. So on the bottom of this phylogenetic tree, if you can see my cursor, I don't know, the very bottom, that's a, a scale in millions of years. And so 
uh, this species began to split about 30 million years ago. Um, and most of those species split between 10 and 20 million years. And so this is a really, really old lineage. And it makes some of these relationships really interesting, especially um, when we take a little bit of a different look at a cleaner phylogenetic tree. And um, we see some really interesting groupings here that would maybe not uh, be like, you know, and very intuitive. So this one is, we see the Indo-West Pacific is more closely related to the Red Sea species than anything else. And that makes sense considering the Red Sea is part of the Indian Ocean. But these other relationships are really weird. So the South Central Pacific and Japan are more closely related to the Caribbean than they are to the other co-occurring Indo-West Pacific or Red Sea lineage in the same ocean basin. And so this um, is a really, really unique example of um, how these animals can become distributed around the world, especially when we're talking about the time scales that we're, we're talking about 10 to 20 million years ago, there was a lot going on um, and the world looked like a little bit different of a place. So now we have an updated range map um, of the species that we've we found using DNA sequencing. And then based on these relationships that we've we found in the phylogenetic tree, we can then start to map a history and really tell a story about how this tiny little one centimeter shrimp made its way around the world and then diversified into five different things. And so um, 20 million years ago, 30 million years ago, there was an open seaway um, where the present day Mediterranean was um, and it connected, there's a band of um, fully connected tropical water and this was called the Tethys Ocean or the Tethys Sea. Um, so yeah, so if you can envision an open ocean channel um, going from the Mediterranean through the Arabian Peninsula and into the Atlantic, uh, 20, 30 million years ago, that was really a hotbed of tropical marine biodiversity. But as Africa slammed, moved north and slammed into the Eurasian continent, that Tethy Sea closed. So all those shrimp um, and all the fish and all the corals and everything that were there basically got partitioned into two ocean basins in the Atlantic and the Indo-Pacific. And so that deep split we see in the tree is likely because of the continental shelf or the two continental plates uh, colliding and closing that ocean. Um, but again, this is really, really old. So if you're in the, if you're in the Caribbean 10 to 20 million years ago, uh, the Isthmus of Panama hasn't formed yet. So not only did it split into the Atlantic, there was still an open seaway in between the Atlantic and the Eastern Pacific. And so these shrimp, what our best hypothesis is based on the tree, is that the shrimp made it back into the Pacific, dispersed all the way across the tropical Eastern Pacific, which is why we have uh, species in the Marquesas that are more closely related uh, to the Caribbean than they are to the, to the other species in the Indo-West Pacific that live uh, right next to it. So uh, this was a really fun project to work on. And then of course, the last one, we get a little diversification into the Red Sea, but this is a really good example of how we can take DNA sequencing, we can sample these individuals in the trade and really understand not only how many species there are, but really understand the biogeographic origin. So really tell an interesting uh, evolutionary story about this tiny little shrimp that we all keep in our tanks and breed and, and enjoy to look at. So that's kind of the first story today. So Thor is five species. And again, there are, a couple little, there are a couple little details now that we go back and look at this shrimp, and I've talked to Andy about this a little bit, um, that we might be able to tell some physical characteristics that are actually different between some of these different lineages. But um, until we had the DNA, we didn't really know if those meant anything. Okay, so the next little bit I'm gonna talk about is uh, the clownfish sea anemone symbiosis. And so this is obviously, I don't think there's a more representative example or maybe um, representative organism for the entire aquarium trade than a clownfish. I'm sure every single person in here has a clownfish. I imagine you all probably have had or have sea anemones uh, in your tanks right now. So we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, this, this symbiosis. This is the only slide I'm gonna talk about fish, I promise. But uh, what we know about the clownfish sea anemone symbiosis is that there are 30 species of clownfish. Roughly, there are probably still a couple that haven't been described. But it's a really, mo it's a model example of what a mutualism is. So the, the fish obviously can live within the toxic venomous tentacles 
of the anemone, they get protection. Um, but the anemone actually also gets protection uh, from the fish. So you probably have all gotten bitten by your clownfish. They're highly aggressive, they're not very nice. Um, and so that ha that's really important for the anemones on the reef. So these animals will chase away butterfly fish and sea turtles and basically anything uh, that gets close to it. I always wear gloves when I sample the anemones because you're getting bit all the time underwater by the fish. <laughs> and so uh, of these 30 species, this is um, a really classic example of what's called an adaptive radiation. So once the fish evolved to live with the host anemones, uh, they diversified really rapidly. So 25 of the 30 species of clownfish actually have evolved within just the last 5 million years. So it's a really fast um, diversifying group. And so uh, we know quite a bit. This has all been fairly well uh, figured out for the most part. There's still a couple questions here and there about how many species of clownfish there are. But nobody's been doing any of the work on the hosts. So that's really my specialty right now is working on the clownfish host anemones. Um, and these were all described way back in the 1800s, typically late 1800s, um, just using the physical characteristics. So within the clownfish hosting uh, symbiosis or the clownfish hosting anemones, there are only 10 described species of host. Um, sea anemones are really challenging animals to work with. If you take one out of the water, it just goes limp, it just turns into this ball of mush. Um, there, are, there are no hard parts at all. Uh, there are very few physical characteristics that you can use to actually differentiate between different species of sea anemones. And so it's made it really challenging. There are also some molecular challenges that have historically presented problems to working with sea anemones. And so um, it's 2019 and we really don't know much about the hosts, even though this is probably one of the most well-studied uh, symbiotic interactions on the planet from the fish perspective. And so last summer we kind of started to tackle this at the American Museum of Natural History and uh, we just recently published a paper. Um, we built a, the largest phylogenetic data set for sea anemones that have ever, ever been built um, using a lot of previously published data but also um, a lot of these newly collected individuals and we found that symbiosis within sea anemones has evolved three times independently. So within the clownfish, there was one independent origin um, of the symbiosis, and then they radiated from there. But with the sea anemones, you have, within these 10 species, um, fish have evolved, or the anemones have evolved to, to host clownfish at least three times. So we're starting to kind of disentangle um, the evolutionary history of the host, um, but this project uh, wasn't doing the kind of sequencing that needed to be done to really figure out how many species of hosts there actually were. So we were using some really slowly mutating genes um, that really didn't give you kind of this fine scale resolution that was needed. So uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna give you a couple examples about how we've used some of these next generation sequencing technologies um, to really get at some lower level questions about how many species of host anemones there actually are. So this first one, of course, is everybody's probably most recognizable anemone. It's the bubble tip anemones. Anyone in here, I'm sure, have them in their tank right now? So one of the things that's blown my mind even being here this, uh, this weekend is finding out about, like, now we have designer ones like the Colorado Sunburst, and I had not heard of that one yet, um, that are selling for up to $2,000 a piece, which is just mind-boggling. But these are stunning animals. And uh, I can see why everybody wants them in the tank. And uh, they're highly variable. I mean, this is, these are pictures of all things that are considered the bubble tip sea anemone. Um, and this one up in the upper right hand corner is really unique. Uh, my collaborator sent me this one. That's up by, up by Japan, <coughs> excuse me, up by Japan, up near Tokyo. So that's a carpet of bubble tip anemones um, with some kelp intermixed. And there are no fish anywhere in that picture. So, um, these are really weird animals. Uh, they have a huge range of colors and shapes and sizes. And so uh, we wanted to test how many, uh, how many species are potentially um, hidden within uh, what's considered the bubble tip sea anemone. And so this is the geographic range of what is considered Entecmea quadricolor. Um, it hosts the most number of clownfish symbionts or anemone fish symbionts. It hosts up to 13 different species in the wild. 
Um, like I said, it's highly variable from a, a physical outward appearance, um, but there's also some really unique ecological and reproductive variation within these animals. So you can see around the Arabian Peninsula, I have it highlighted in red. <laughs> so in the Red Sea and in the Gulf of Oman and in the Arabian Sea, these animals only sexually reproduce. So we're really familiar with the ones that clone. You probably, um, you know, some of you probably get so many bubble tips, you probably just start giving them away or selling them back into the trade. Uh, but around the Arabian Peninsula, they do not do that. They, you only find solitary individuals. Um, but the rest of the range, of course, they're highly clonal. You'll find big aggregations of uh, asexual uh, Entecme quadricolors. And then um, some of the other interesting things is even on the same reef, you get differences. So on really, really shallow reefs, you'll get these big extensive aggregations of Entecme quadricolor that might host Amphiprion melanopus or Phrenatus. Um, but deeper on the same reef, you'll get a large solitary individual that might host Premnus, the maroon clownfish. And so there's some, some of these things like the sexual reproduction versus asexual reproduction, the differences we see on these reefs are some pretty nice like a priori hypotheses that these are probably going to be different things when we sequence their DNA. Um, so we've worked the last couple years to acquire samples from throughout the range and at this point I really want to uh, say a special thank you to Cans Marine and Kevin Cohen at Live Aquaria. They've been really instrumental in helping me get animals from specific locations where they collect in Australia. <clears throat> Tonga and some other places. Um, <clears throat> so the last couple of years being really involved with MACNA has been a huge boon to my research. Um, and so we've done an okay job. We're still missing a couple spots. Um, and then I don't know if Randy's here or not this morning. Randy Donowitz of reefs.com has a tank at his place in Brooklyn, which is just down the road from the museum, which is just full of rose bubble tips. And it's the same genetic lineage um, has been in, this, in the trade in the New York area for over 30 years. So he got this um, from a, a guy named uh, Greg Scheimer about 20 years ago. And it's just been propagating ever since. Um, it's the same lineage at Long Island Aquarium with Joe Waiulo. And uh, no one really knows where it came from. It's been in the trade for so long. So I went down and I took a tentacle clipping and included it. Uh, just to see if we could kind of pin down what species it was and where it was from maybe in the world. <clears throat> so we ended up with about 85 individuals um, and instead of using a kind of classic DNA se sequencing technique where we do, uh, we sequence one gene at a time, uh, we use what's called this next generation sequencing where we can, we can sequence tens of thousands of fragments of DNA per individual simultaneously across the genome. So it gives us more data than you could possibly imagine. Um, you can't just open up a text file with this you know, DNA file on your computer or your laptop will crash. So we have to use like high performance computing on a cluster. Um, but anyway, it allows us to really get a ton of data and really pin down how many species there are. So for this particular sequencing run, each individual ended up with about 2,500 gene fragments or DNA fragments that we could use to figure out how many species of bubble tips there were. So um, just like the other genetic clustering plot of the drafts that I showed, we build those same kind of clustering plots um, for my work. And so what you can see just really immediately is that there are really distinct um, genetic groups. So each color more or less represents um, a unique genetic lineage with a couple caveats here and there. But immediately what pops out um, is that you see that the Red Sea and the UAE, so the Arabian Peninsula group is different. The Maldives are different from that, which is interesting because it's actually pretty close um, to the Red Sea. Singapore is different. Um, I had one sample sneak in there from the Philippines. Um, but there seems to be some really interesting things going on in Japan where they might have two or maybe even three species just within the Japanese archipelago. Um, so, but going back to Randy's mystery anemone, uh, it turns out to fall into this blue group, which make a lot of sense. Most of these animals are coming from the Philippines anyway, and they have historically, so it would make a lot of sense that it belonged to a lineage um, that was also found there. So maybe mystery solved in, in Randy's case. But we still see a lot of 
unique genetic differentiation here. So what does this mean and are these actually new species? Um, is this representative of enough evidence to call these some of new species? So um, some evidence. First of all, like I mentioned, around the Arabian Peninsula, these things only sexually reproduce. They are also genetically distinct from everything else. So I think that's really solid evidence that this is actually a, a new, unique thing. If you take a bit of a higher look and the clustering, um, what you can see is that this has a really ancient Tethian origin as well, just like Thor. So it means that the species group is probably at least 30 or 40 million years old. Um, but it means that everything from the Indo-West Pacific, like the Maldives and Singapore and Japan and Australia, Tonga, they're all more closely related to each other than they are to what's going on around the Arabian Peninsula, which is really interesting. And then probably my favorite part about uh, this whole story is what's going on in Japan. So uh, my collaborators in Japan have taken a picture of every single individual anemone that they collect uh, tissue from or genetic sample from on the reef. And so we can go back and we can link each individual to each bar here. Uh, and there's, no, there's nothing you can look at to tell these things apart. So uh, they occur across the same depth. They're occurring across the same reefs in Japan. They're, they're wildly different colors. Um, but when we go back to the data, the only thing that can, you can tell them apart by <clears throat> is that they host different fish on the reef. So it's really a really interesting example of how these fish are actually keying in on these cryptic species. So we look at these things, can't tell them apart without using DNA sequencing, but the fish know and they're segregating. So uh, Amphiprion clarki only was hosting in this blue species in Japan. And uh, Amphiprion frenatus was only hosting um, in this orange species. And it gets a little more interesting and I'm just gonna give you a really busy phylogenetic tree. Um, <clears throat> but the, the Japanese species that host, <clears throat> host Amphiprion clarki are more closely related to the anemones in the Maldives, which also hosted Amphiprion clarki, than they are to the other Japanese species that hosts Amphiprion frenatus, if that makes sense. Hopefully that does. Um, so that's really interesting. It's also interesting because the Singapore samples that we have also host Amphiprion frenatus, and you can kind of see them clustering together there, kind of highlighted that group in orange. Um, and then you can see how the Arabian Peninsula, down at the bottom, um, is distinct from everything else. And so there's a lot going on in Entec May, Quadricolor, the bubble tips. Um, and what's really interesting is that the uh, type species for the whole Entec Maya genus um, is from the Red Sea. Almost nothing is collected in the Red Sea, so that basically means that everybody in here <clears throat> has undescribed species in their tanks. So when we get around to formally describing these new Entec Maya quadricolor, um, everything is gonna get a new name. So Entec Maya quadricolor will be only found in the Red Sea in the Arabian Peninsula, and we'll have to name everything else a totally different thing. So you all have uh, cryptic, undescribed species uh, in your tanks on purpose. <laughs> okay, um, so I have a couple other examples. Um, hopefully I'm not losing you here, it's still pretty early. Um, so we did some work, some interesting work. So the, the bubble tip story kind of shows how when you sample across a really wide geographic range, these things kind of segregate by locality. But we also see some really interesting things happening um, even when you're sampling uh, on the same reef, just in different habitats. So in 2018, I went to the Maldives and um, Heteractus magnifica, or the Ritteri anemone, were everywhere. <coughs> and these atolls present some really unique opportunities to sample across really different habitats in a really close space. And so um, the bottom here is the bottom part of the atoll. So, um, on the very bottom of the slide, that would be like the outer atoll, so that's exposed to the open ocean. Um, you also have these really shallow reef flats that are about a meter deep. And then inside the lagoon, which is partially enclosed from everything else, uh, you get these little patch reefs that begin to pop up. And so in the Maldives, we see um, 
these Ritteri anemones, these Heteractus magnificas, are distributed across each of these habitats. So out on the outer fore reef, of course, they're getting hammered by the waves. Uh, they host this endemic Maldivian anemone fish. Um, <clears throat> but in the shallow reef flat, um, again, this is one meter deep. We get this really different phenotype. It's pale. It doesn't have this nice, beautiful purple or pink column, and it hosts no fish at all. You can imagine this thing just getting baked in the sun all day. And then in the lagoonal patch reef, um, they look superficially similar to what we see in the outside of the atoll. So they host fish again. They're these big, nice, plump anemones. So we decided we were going to sample um, individuals from across each of these different habitats and just see if there is any kind of unique genetic thing going on. Um, and so we found some cool stuff. It turns out, again, up in the upper left-hand corner is another little genetic clustering plot. Uh, the individuals are really, really different to the point that these are probably different species just within the Maldives, just where we sampled, and that we didn't sample anything that was more than 10 kilometers apart. So these are really close together. <coughs> Um, but when we included stuff from the Red Sea, which are these little, these individuals up on the top, top right-hand corner, which I don't really know if it's coming through all that well or not, um, we see some weird, weird relationships. Um, so first of all, probably getting this what's called ecological speciation, so differentiating across these different habitats. But if you look right here at this little part of the tree, that is actually showing that the samples we took from the reef flat and in the lagoon are actually more closely related to the anemones we sampled in the Red Sea than they are to the anemones that we sampled on the outside of the fore reef um, of the same atoll in the Maldives. So we're getting some really weird relationships. And we need to expand our sampling to kind of figure out why. Um, but again, it just kind of is another example that what is going on on these coral reefs is really, really complicated. It has an, you know, a massive amount of diversity in a really small area, and there are all these different things that are going on and generating uh, diversity on these reefs. So I don't know. Does anyone have one of these anemones in their tank? You probably have to have a pretty big tank. No? They're not quite as common, but um, I know they are traded. You might have this one. Anyone have a, a sea bay anemone, Heteractus crispa? Maybe one hand. Yeah, they're, um, they're a little bit harder to keep from what I understand. So we did some more sampling again with uh, Heteractus crispa. This will be my last uh, little example here. Um, again, a species complex. This is probably two species. So we have the Red Sea um, as being different from everything else. And then what you can kind of see is from the United Arab Emirates, Japan, Palau, and Tonga. Um, there look like there are two groups, this gray group and this blue group, but because they're not really very cleanly separated from each other, it looks like there might be some reproduction going on within them, so we might consider that all one species. So the, the blue and the gray would be one species, and then the, red, or the orange would be a completely separate species. Again, this was described from the Red Sea, so my guess is that if you have one of these in your tank, you have an undescribed uh, species to science. So. Um, to kind of wrap this all up, going back to the original question, uh, are there cryptic undescribed species in the trade? Uh, well, it's obviously absolutely yes. Um, and my guess would be there would be somewhere between two to three times more species diversity in the ornamental aquarium trade than what we currently recognize uh, taxonomically in the scientific literature. So when you go back in your tanks, some of these really common animals that you know really, really well or you think you know really well um, might, in fact, be completely new to science. Um, so we love to hear from hobbyists. We love to hear from the trade. It's been really, really um, helpful for my research um, to be so plugged in. And so, uh, yeah, if you have any questions or anything, I'm happy to uh, entertain them via email or anything else. So with that, I would uh, really like to thank MACNA 2019 um, especially, again, Kevin Cohen, uh, Laura Simmons from Cans Marine have really supplied some really invaluable uh, samples. Um, the MASNA Graduate Fellowship um, that I received a couple years ago is still helping me acquire some of these animals. And uh, a bunch of collaborators um, help in the lab and, and also collect these things. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions.